Hello, everyone, and welcome to the forefront of healthcare innovation. In an era where artificial intelligence reigns supreme, I welcome you to join us on a journey to uncover its impact in healthcare. This is the Future of AI and Health podcast series that we're doing in collaboration with Healthline Media and Outcomes Rocket. I'm your host, Saul Marquez, and I'll be doing this series together with the outstanding Dr. Jenny Yu, Chief Health Officer at Healthline Media. We're excited to give you this series to help you illuminate the path forward on what AI means to healthcare today and in the future. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Outcomes Rocket on this series on the future of AI and healthcare in partnership with Healthline Media. I'm so excited to be back on the podcast with my co host, Dr. Jenny Yu. Jenny, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back, Saul. It's good to see you. Of course. It's been a, a lot of fun co hosting these with you. And we're on our final interview of this amazing series. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our guest today. His name is Ed Gaudet. He is a seasoned CEO and founder with over 25 years of experience in software, specializing in product, marketing, and sales. He's currently the founder and CEO of Sensinet, uh, a company focused on the third-party risk and enterprise risk management. Uh, he's a former CMO of Improvada, and he's held various strategic roles as a startup founder, as well as in corporate healthcare and software. So I'm so pumped to have Ed on the podcast as part of this Future in AI Health series. Ed, welcome. Wow, thanks for the intro, Saul. That was, that was <laughs> that's quite humbling. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely, Ed. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And, and so look, I'll go ahead and kick off with the first question. Talk to us really about your platform and what you guys are doing. How do you assist hospitals in evaluating cybersecurity readiness of third-party vendors? Yeah, so, um, you know, a few years ago, we took a look at how hospitals, health systems were evaluating risk, um, uh, cyber risk associated with not only their internal systems, but also their third-party ecosystem uh, vendors and products. And we found there was an opportunity to really um, make that process go a lot smoother through a series of automation and the way we um, actually created or, or constructed the overall platform, if you will. And so we've built um, what we call today a multi-sided network, started off as a two-sided network that connects, directly connects providers and payers with their ecosystem of third-party vendors and products that they run through the risk assessment process. And we do that really to enable them to do more with less on both sides of the network, right? Um, it's a it's a pretty big undertaking to to assess risk, um, security risk. Um, there are a lot of different frameworks and different types of questions and questionnaires. And I remember when I was at Improvada, we would get all you know different types of requests from potential customers, uh, and they were all different. They were typically in a spreadsheet or maybe in a Word doc or even PDFs. The questions would all be, you know, a range um, that differed from the type of question, the semantics of the question, the responses and how we could respond to them. Uh, sometimes we'd get questions that just were not applicable. Um, you know, did you, you know, can you update the firmware? Well, we're not really a hardware vendor or a software vendor, right? So, so um, these things were obviously not only frustrating, but took time out of the process. And, and ultimately, both sides have a set of objectives, right? The provider the payer, they want to ensure that when they're working with a vendor, that obviously the vendor has the right set of security processes and procedures and controls in place um, to, uh, you know, to build that level of trust over that relationship. In addition, they want to ensure that the product also has the level of trust, that level of control, the level of controls needed to ensure that the product is deployed properly and being used properly and doesn't create risk with with patient data with patient safety um you know we certainly never want a scenario where an attack to a provider or through a third party provider shuts down a health system right um there's a lot at stake when that happens so um so this notion of leverage and taking time out of that process while adding value new value became sort of the, the design principle and the mantra as we began to work with customers so um, so today, there's a lot of things that we've added um, to that overall process through the automation. Um, you know, for example, if you have a small team, but you have a large 
population of vendors and products, uh, it's very hard, very difficult for that team to get to everybody, to get to all the vendors and all the different products. And so typically they'll artificially bucket them into, um, you know, critical high risk buckets. But until you actually go through the process of the assessment, it's really hard to get that correctly. So we enable organizations through the automation to do as much and conduct as many assessments uh, as they need, basically to run their business correctly. And so, you know, not trying to um, put those, um, you know, or assuming vendors or products are at a certain level of risk without actually capturing the data the needed work. to make yeah. those, uh, you know, make the, the proper analysis. It's so important. And that's only the beginning of the journey you have with that vendor. Obviously, you want to identify risk and you want to be able to detect it through some regular monitoring tools, but you also want to be able to remediate it. And so by enabling this network of vendors, products, and payers uh, and providers, it really enables the, the reduction of risk across the network. And it really, you know, this whole notion of all, you know, all boats float, right? If, if, if the tide's coming With in, tide, yes. well, s s similarly, you know, if everyone is kind of focused on driving down the risk, you get this interesting network effect that you couldn't get if you were doing this on your own in a pipeline-based application. That's great, Ed. No, I, I I love the context around it. And certainly the network effect seems to have a, a big impact. And it also, I mean, from I, I'm thinking, gives you so much more data to work with to allow automation and models to do what they do to help the people that need this help, understaffed. So I, I love that. Um, I'll, I, I'll kick it over to Jenny because the next question really does relate to kind of the data. Yeah, sure. and thank you for um, really setting that up. I know that working in a health system previously, um, there are large and small vendors and there's such a complex network, right, of medical devices and revenue cycle management vendors, uh, as well as, um, you know, electronic health records and such. How do you believe that um, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning models, can offer and ensure an ongoing monitoring assessment of these third-party risks? And how do you see that sort of play uh, in the in the role of automation? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and it's it's a real it's you know it's uncharted territory, right? It, it's it's new. We're we're doing a lot with AI at Sensinet, as well on both sides of the of the network, right? With vendors and with customers, um, like providers and payers. And so, you know, initially, um, you know, as you think about the vast surface effectively that AI represents and presents, right? You have the risk, obviously, to the organization through the adoption of those technologies and products, et cetera. And so there's there's the the need to really apply the right level of scrutiny that may differ from your the approach that you took with a cloud, a simple cloud-based application or even an on-premise application or or a device, et cetera. So so being able to first and foremost assess the level of risk associated with an AI application, maybe that you've just developed, or maybe that you're licensing from an external party, or maybe it's a combination of both, right? That's really important. And, and, and understanding the threats associated with AI, which are very different than threats that may be associated with, say, a non-AI based tool. And then of course, everything's becoming AI enabled, right? So you've got this hybrid approach that has to be also considered when you think about your assessments, not pure AI any longer. Maybe it came in through the organization based on an upgrade to an existing application or service that I've been using, right? Or maybe it was a patch that was done. And so now I have this AI enabled application that I have to treat differently and assess different, differently. So there's that whole set of consideration on the on the on the customer side that has to go into the the approach as they think about AI. Then there's the application of AI as it relates to cybersecurity, as it relates to maybe doing the security risk risk assessment process even better, even more accurate. Right. So we we believe that you know as we think about this overall notion of leverage and the amount of time it takes to get a uh, a full assessment done right so the initial leverage we get out of the tool without ai you know is taking a process that's 45 days or greater in length 
The first time it's done down to 10 days or less, that's our SLA. So a significant savings right there, right out of the gate. The next time a new provider comes in and assesses that existing vendor on the platform, it's the click of a button, which is really cool, right? But what about new vendors that are coming in? Even how do we take that time of 10 days? How do we take that down and compress it even, even more? We do that through AI automation, right? By we enable AI tools at the front end of the assessment process for the vendor so that they can speed up the time it takes to get those answers, that data uploaded into the system and over to the provider. And the accuracy, um, because now they're using existing data that they may have already used in the previous assessment, right? Leveraging, again, that, that notion of leverage, getting leverage out of the existing work that you did with maybe, you know, uh, uh, three weeks ago, you did a, an assessment for, you know, uh, that was not done in the SenseNet network, but was done out of band. Now you can leverage that data to complete the uh, SenseNet assessment much quicker. Um, so compressing that time, giving the tools to the provider to also do speed up the assessment, the analysis, the report writing and generation, um, which we do today already, but even bringing that down to uh, 30 minutes or less is really our, our end goal. It's still co-pilot. It's not an autopilot. So you still need someone. And we think this is where AI will be over the next decade or so. You still need that, you know, the interaction with, with the person at the other end that is attesting to the data. Yep, I reviewed it. It all looks good. Or maybe it uh, looks a little off here. Let me go back. Oh, sure. Yeah, that, that, that answer was wrong or that, that analysis was incorrect, so we need to change that, right? It's still a co-pilot, and it should be a co-pilot for a while until we you know, perfect the, 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 the data analysis on, and, uh, and processing on the AI side. Yeah, and, and that's great to hear that um, there's such efficiency being done in looking at the kind of, like you said, patterns of templates. Um, so it's like a rinse and repeat in terms of you know, using the AI um, to improve the efficiency. And, and I agree that, um, you know, the human in the loop for now um, makes sense. And even just seeing how AI has come, you know, six or nine months ago, um, I'm just oh, as, sort of astonished, right? Astonished at um, the speed in which uh, this all the adoption is happening. Um, so, yeah, great to hear that that's the work that's being done uh, on your end as well. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree, Jenny. And, I mean, it sounds like, Ed, taking people from spreadsheet inferno to click of a button with this network of, of, of people that just get smarter and smarter uh, and faster and faster. In, in your opinion, on a, staying on the AI, to, AI topic, since that's kind of the series run, what, what are the biggest opportunities you see for AI in healthcare? And are the bad guys using it against us too? Yeah, great question. So um, I, let me start with the second question. Um, that's an easy answer. Yes, of course they are. Um, they are more organized, better coordinated and collaborated than they've ever been. We've seen that even over the last couple of years where they've taken this notion of cyber attacks and they perfected it and organized it in a way that they create these micro services, right? So someone creates the attack, someone launches the attack, someone goes in and, and, and collects and processes the, the, the ransom or or you know uh, the the actual money that's being requested right and it's never the same person so they've distributed those those capabilities out in an organized fashion to be much more effective and we've seen the unfortunately we, we we've seen the results of that across the industry um but with that being said technology always presents these amazing opportunities for industry right and so you asked about the biggest opportunities for ai in healthcare well first it starts with the patient better patient care right that's always that's always the goal and so applying ai to get better outcomes that's the holy grail that's what we want to do is to be able to apply ai in a way that delivers a better experience a better set of outcomes for patients in a way that we can't do today right so it's you talk about the future of ai i always think about and i always i always reflect on how movies or or television are interesting predictor of, of, of the future. Um, right. So like, you know, um, uh, Star Trek, I'm sure you watched Star Trek when, when you were younger. Right. And, and they have this, they, you know, their, their, their experience of healthcare was go inside this 
this tube, if you will, and the thing would scan you automatically and maybe give you a shot or take blood or so, I mean, ultimately we're going to get there. There'll be a day where in your house, you know, use your healthcare pod and, you know, every periodically you go in, you get scanned, maybe they take some blood, whatever. Maybe they don't even need to take blood anymore. We're using a better way of doing it. Right. And all of your care will be delivered that way, or most of your care will be delivered that way. I mean, we have Da Vinci for surgical care today. Imagine for small surger surgeries, you could actually do it in that context of your home in that tube environment, right? I don't know, right? But <laughs> it's going to happen at some level. Like this is happening so fast. There will be a day where literally, you know, that that your 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 health closet or you will your health tube is where you go to get most of your care. And with that being said, um, that's kind of an exciting place to be, but it's also a little scary as well. And so part and parcel with the outcomes is the safety aspect of this, right? So we have to have that balance of better outcomes, but safer patient care, right? We've got to worry about the patient safety. We have to keep that front, front and center. We cannot, um, you know, we can't substitute outcomes for safety ever, right? We have to consider them always. And so I think, you know, th those in a nutshell are the biggest opportunities. It's better care. Uh, it's better and in, in, in better safety of that care over time. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a number of different ways we'll get there, but I think it's, it's, it's an exciting time to be, I think, um, a little scary, but, but pretty exciting too, at the same yeah, time. Yeah. I'll tell you, Ed, I, I, I agree so much with you. I mean, the other day I was, I was having a talk with, uh, the chief technology officer of, uh, of sleep number. Mm. What yes. those beds are doing now, they right, could, right. they might as well be hospital beds. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so right, exactly. Yeah, the tube is here. I think yeah, uh, the tube. Yeah, yeah. Well, at, piecing it you, together. Yeah. Yeah. And you, when you were when you were both talking, I was having the Jetson sort of like image in my head. Um, there's so much remote yeah. patient monitoring. There's so much sort of thinking of um, care at home as we move into the future, and we know we cannot right with technology, uh, with um, potentially artificial intelligence. And I know that. Um, um, Ed, as we were talking about sort of patient safety and patient outcomes, I can't help but also think of patient experience in general, right? Like I feel like healthcare is always a little bit behind. And when you think about, you know, uh, the e-commerce platforms, right, where now everything just exists so seamlessly uh, within an experience where, you know, you log on, you can, they take your credit card, they can do Apple, whatever it may be, there's not the clunkiness of sort of you know, shifting in and out of um, platforms or vendors, uh, you know, it's all integrated and there's interoperability and then there's an ability for the user to feel that it's a seamless experience. And I think that's where healthcare has to get to. Um, and I'm excited for that in terms of what, you know, automation, AI and technology can do. Um, but to get there, as you have mentioned, we also need to then think about sort of the risks associated with it. And I would love to just hear some of your success stories that you can share in terms of what your platform has done in terms of helping whether hospitals, providers, you know, systems, vendors to mitigate some of this, um, you know, cy cybersecurity risk. Because every day I get an email to say my data has been breached somewhere on some sort of platform. Um, so talk yeah. about, you know, a little bit, just some of the success stories and, and how you see that uh, as the win for mitigating risk within healthcare. Sure, sure. So, you know, it starts with, again, the basics and a lot of this, a lot of the basics are ap applicable to AI, right? So um, it, it's not, it's not necessarily new. I'll point out sort of the foundational aspects and then I'll go into sort of what's new. But, um, you know, first and foremost, it's really identifying and understanding the technical controls that are in place um, and that need to be in place um, based on the risk profile of the organization, right? So if if multi-factor is required and it's not there, then obviously you want to know about it. And so that's a good way to see, well, look, they don't have MFA. We need MFA. Um, so either they need to add, the vendor needs to add it, or we need to find an alternative solution. Similarly, if the vendor is, um, uh, you know, has support for SSO, but doesn't have support for the standard that's being used by the health system, again, good to know because we can't use it. We can't adopt it properly unless we have those controls in place. So then there are contractual controls, um, understanding the use of the data and whether or not it's protected health information. And if it is, then we need a BAA as a contractual control. Um, so 
Also, we may need a certain level of insurance. So we need the certificate of insurance as well as part of that re assessment process. So it's not just the answers to the questionnaire, but it's also supporting evidence to be used in that, that, that assessment process. And then based on the tiering of the vendor, whether it's a critical to our overall organization, based on a business impact analysis and understanding of how that works within the organization, what business process it affects, right? Then we may want to do a reassessment uh, annually versus every two years, um, or maybe even more frequent. Having that automated as part of the platform is really important. Now, that happens regardless of whether you're an AI-enabled solution or, 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 or not. With an AI, there are aspects of risk that are different. And so you want to also include those aspects in your overall risk management process. And you want to think about it, not just with your third parties, but you want to think about it as part of your enterprise risk as well. So one thing that we've done recently is we've added the NIST based AI RMF assessment into our product. So now a provider can look at their own organization, their own controls, and their own process and procedures and policies relative to how they're adopting AI within the organization itself. Similarly, we have AI questions within each, what we call product type. So if you're a cloud application or you're a hardware device or you're a medical device or you're some IOT device, maybe you're consulting and applying services based on AI. We wanna make sure that we capture those in the overall assessment process as well. So adding questionnaires specific to the, uh, to the approach, the types of risks that could, and threats that could be, um, that could be available based on the introduction of the technology or the service by the third party and looking at the internal organization process procedures, controls, resources, um, as it applies to their management of AI. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. And then, you know, there's some really good things to look at. Um, Sandy Dunn, who is a uh, uh, focuses in AI, she published recently an AI threat map um, that identifies seven threats. So it's again, these are different threats than you would get maybe from another type of technology. But there's threats from the AI model itself. There's threats when using the AI model. There's threats that can happen to the AI model. Right? These are all different. There's legal and regulatory threats. There's the dependency threat. What happens when you become too dependent on AI? What's the threat to the organization? What happens if you don't use it? So what are the competitive threats, right? If you're actually not applying AI to your business, um, or if you don't understand the actual models that you've deployed, how can you tune appropriately if you don't understand the model? So, so that represents seven threats. I'm sure we'll, we'll go, you know, another six months and we'll have 10 more threats that we'll identify, right? So this is a, a rapidly evolving and changing, uh, um, obviously, um, uh, technology type and, and threat landscape as it relates to AI. But we're learning a lot, which is good. There's a lot of heat and light on this and energy on really understanding the risks associated with AI. And again, it starts with good governance. So, you know, you have to have a strong governance approach to this. Um, so independent of the assessments and the types of technical assessments you do, the type of organizational assessments you do, whether they be for a third party or for your own internal organization, you also have to think about governance differently as well. I love it. Yeah, well, a lot, a lot to think about there, Ed, and <laughs> great question, Jenny. For everybody listening, um, you know, you're probably working with this, you're dealing with this, you're thinking about this, um, we do this, these types of shows so that you could get the tip of the spear on, on people working on AI, cybersecurity. So definitely make sure you check out the show notes after we're done. You'll have links to, to Sensinet and our entire series there. So make sure you take advantage of working with the experts. Ed, what tips or advice as we close out this interview today, yeah. would you give to health leaders listening and watching on the adoption of AI? Sure. Well, first and foremost, if you're just starting to think about AI, you're already behind. So there are risks within your organization that you don't even know about. Your customers, the people that are using your technology to do their jobs, 
they're adopting AI. It's happening today, whether you know it or not. So, so start again with that governance process and set of policies to make it very clear where they can use AI and where they can't use AI. And it's remember, it's not just about new products. Obviously, it's easier to look at it from the context of a new product coming in. You also have to look at it through those upgrades and patches with existing products and services as well. So that's, the, that's another vector of risk that you may or not be thinking about, even if you already have a governance process in place for the adoption of new technology where there may be AI, right? So it's coming from all, <laughs> unfortunately, the surface has gotten so much larger from, from, a, from a risk perspective now that with the introduction of AI, because it, it's, it's the threat of existing products and services. It's the threat of new products and services. And then it's the threat of external products and services that your, your users are introducing, whether you know it or not, through their, their own personal phones or their own uh, personal devices. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, I was going to say some of the existing vendors, you can already see that there's AI enablement uh, with those existing vendors. And that, as Ed, Ed was talking, um, sometimes it just feels like, you know, even if you have governance in place, uh, you're not going to sort of capture all of the potential risk, whether someone's using it on their personal phone and whatnot. Um, and so it sounds like, you know, we just have to be continuously sort of thinking about the risk, monitoring the risk, and then using expertise such you know, as Ed and others out there, um, because, you know, with healthcare, uh, it, it just feels like we are at the sort of tip of the sphere in, in, uh, in terms of, um, you know, what, what are, what's going to happen with all the data and then what's going to happen with all this technology. And it's moving faster than I think the regulations can even, um, you know, uh, be set in place. And so um, very, very interesting uh, kind of dichotomy of, of, of world that we live in now. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Jenny. There's a lot for us to to think about here uh, and reflect on. So definitely, let's take advantage of of our time together with Ed to to really give it some serious thought. Are you doing what you should be doing? Can you be doing better? Um, Ed, on that note, for the people that uh, want to reach out, learn more about what you and your team are doing, and also, by the way, I've been following your podcast, Risk Never Sleep. So. Let's, let's give you an opportunity to plug that and then share with the listeners best way that they can get in touch. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. So uh, best way to get in touch, um, you can always send me an email, egaudet, E-G-A-U-D-E-T at sensinet, C-E-N-S-I-N-E-T dot com. Um, you can check out our website, www.sensinet.com. Our podcasts are available on all of the, the major podcast platforms, uh, Spotify, Apple, et cetera. Um, and I think we're approaching 90 um, episodes, which is Huge. kind of amazing. I just started this thing last year, so <laughs> it just blows my mind that we're 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 almost at 100. Um, so, and and we you know we're very blessed that to have really the, the you know really the interesting, um, the cream of the crop when it comes to healthcare and and leaders um, that are been out there. They're on the front lines. They're protecting patient safety and 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 patient care delivery. So. Um, it's really here. That, it's really great to just be able to hear the insight from from several different perspectives on um, not just AI, but just all facets of of, of cybersecurity and IT and patient care. Um, so, uh, um, and, and what was the other question you had? I forgot. Best place to get in touch with you. Oh, so they, so they yeah, I give you the best and... best place. Yeah, but also, I guess last thing I'd add is get involved. There's so many different um, associations and organizations you can get involved with if you're in healthcare. There's the health sector, healthcare sector or health industry sector coordinating council, HSCC. Yeah. Um, that is a lot of activity, a lot of information about AI, but other aspects of cybersecurity um, uh, strategies and programs and technologies uh, on their website. Uh, you can also reach out to the HHS and look at to the 405D, which does the health industry cybersecurity practices. Um, also, they're involved with the cybersecurity performance goals, which have been recently announced. So there's a lot happening on the health and cybersecurity and risk front um, and plenty of opportunity to get involved. And if you want more um, insight into that, again, reach out to me directly. Love it, Ed. Yeah. Such great shares there. want to thank you for participating in today's thank podcast. You. 
And uh, listeners, thanks for joining us, uh, viewing us. Uh, this has been a fun series. Uh, Jenny, you want to ra- wrap us up? Yeah, um, this this has been a fun series. And Ed, thank you for being our final guest uh, for the series. Um, to the listeners, thanks for uh, being with us. And remember to check out their show notes and for t- key takeaways and the links to the resources that was mentioned on today's podcast. Um, thanks again, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks for listening to our series, Future of AI in Health our collaboration with Healthline Media. As we conclude this episode, we invite you to stay tuned for more insightful discussions on the series that we're doing together. The future is now and with knowledge comes empowerment. So I wanna thank you for joining us and looking forward to having you with us on the next time as we explore the impact of AI in healthcare today and in the future.